Welcome to Mindfulness Manufacturing. My name is Trevor Blondiel. Spending 25 years in manufacturing, I discovered the real impact we have on turnover, communication, and the ability to manage change is how we show up. That's the essence of emotional intelligence. In each episode, we bring a guest or message to expand your skills, engage your people, and grow your organization. So let's jump in. In manufacturing, we interact with often the same people. Sometimes it's people that we've known for a long time and we're looking to influence others, right? Because at the end of the day, it's another department. Maybe it's someone in your team. Maybe it's your boss. Maybe it's a supplier. But we are in the business of relationships and influencing others. And this is something that happens daily that we think back to mindfulness. What is mindfulness? Mindfulness is just feeling the shirt on your body, sinking the into your heels and just kind of knowing where you are. That's the hard part. And this is why we started the podcast is because we need those moments where we can kind of step back and think, well, hold on a minute. I've known this person for a while uh, and maybe it's I'm not getting the results that I was looking for. And I got to kind of reflect for a moment. Uh, so I read a book called Infinite Influence and it was written by my friend friend, Alison Van Hoosier. So she's an expert in this whole leadership field. Uh, she goes all over the country doing keynotes and and helping companies uh, influence. Uh, she's got a heck of a background you're going you're gonna to hear about. And uh, she tops it off by being a wife and a mother of four, which is probably the most impressive stories I've heard from Allison. Welcome. Thank you so much, Trevor. I'm excited to be here. You mentioned the word influence. And for someone who's listening to this, I want you to consider right off the bat for a moment, why in the world would I want to influence someone? Because you could immediately think, I don't want to influence anybody, but I would pause for a second and ask you to consider. You might want to, when you think about your team, you might want to influence someone to stay on the team, to not quit. You might want to influence them to level up their performance, influence someone to change, influence someone to take initiative, influence someone to give you an opportunity, influence someone to calm down <laughs> in a heated moment. There are lots of ways you want to influence people. And I'm excited for this conversation today, Trevor, because my goal is to change the way you think about everyone you know, because you have the ability Ooh. right now <laughs> to build infinite influence with anyone everyone, every time. <laughs> and that's funny. And and you and I have talked a little bit before I read your book and just thinking like, you know, what, what is it that I'm going to gain from this? And it, it really made me rethink of just some of the current relationships that I have. And, uh, and just even with people that are close to me about uh, you know, my mantra, stay curious. And it really ties into that. As we start to roll into your stories, one thing you and I really aligned on, and it's in the book is that people think influence can be manipulating others. And it's mm. just the opposite of that. We want to clear that up right now, Allison. Absolutely. So when I think about influence, one thing whenever I started studying influence, one thing I didn't know that I learned was that there are some books that are banned from prison when it comes <laughs> to building influence with people because it's such a powerful thing that anybody can do. So I start off even in the book talking right off the bat that um, yes, you can influence anyone anytime, but it's important to note that if you ever hear Allison Van Hooser talk about influence, one thing we're not doing is talking about manipulation. We're also not talking about motivation. So just very quickly, right off the bat, when I think about, when I think about manipulation, I think about it's a, it's an, I win, you lose outcome that, you know what, I'm going to get you to go all in with me and achieve whatever the goal is, regardless of how it affects you. I'm not interested in helping anyone achieve a negative agenda. So I just have to set that right off the bat. Ethically, morally, I'm here for infinite influence outcomes, meaning you win, the person you're working to influence wins, and your business, the organization you work in or work for that you own, they win. A win-win-win outcome. And let me say this, when it comes to motivation, we have this phrase that we say at Van Hooser Leadership. You know, I don't know who came up with it, but I don't think it was me because I feel like I've heard this ever since I was just a young kid. You can't, I can't, no one can motivate someone to do something they don't want to do. 
I cannot teach you how to motivate someone else because motivation is intrinsic decision-making. I can influence you to choose a different motivator going forward, but I don't get to pick what that is. Ultimately, you decide what you are motivated by. Now, the hope is that if you're not currently motivated to be engaged, to be, or someone on your team's not motivated to be engaged, to go all in, et cetera, the, the intent is that you learn to build infinite influence so you can influence their decision making so that mm. they will choose a motivator going forward that is good for you, for them and for the team. Yeah. And what I, I love about this foundation, because you can't have a podcast called mindfulness and then talk about maybe being strategic and what information you don't share or mislead someone. Mm -hmm. Right. You can't be infinite. Yeah infinite in your influence. And, and I mean, that's, that's part of the essence of all this is just like, we can be honest and we can have a positive influence on others. Like it's an and, 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 and there's no reason why we can't all be in this space because that's how we get that, those long-term relationships. That's how people start thinking different. So what's your story, Allison? What, is there a moment or like part of your time in your job where this kind of really clicked in for you or is this just gradual? Absolutely. There's a moment. And I don't know if you know this story, Trevor, I was, I didn't realize the power of the infinite influence strategy until I had already experienced it several times in my life. I, I finally came up with the words infinite influence after something powerful kept happening in my life. So the first time or the most transformational moment I remember when it comes to building infinite influence was when I was sitting across the table from a bank CEO. I was getting a home loan and the bank CEO called me before we closed and asked, Allison, will you come in a little bit early? I would like to talk with you before you're closing. And my initial thought, this was in 2007, 2008-ish, was that, um, you know, all the new paperwork we had to do because of the economy and all the new regulations mm -hmm. that came out, I thought, for some reason, I'm not going to get this house that I was dreaming of. Ooh. And so he also asked, it was also the time of the Me Too movement, which cracks me up now because whenever he asked me to come into his office, he said, no, I don't want your husband there. Just me and you in my office. This is a closed door meeting. I'm thinking, huh? uh -oh. I know. <laughs> I went anyways, which maybe that was naive, ignorant. I don't know, but I went. We we're sitting across the table. Nothing bad happened in case somebody starts sweating <laughs> listening to this. But we're sitting across the table and he says, you know, Allison, I didn't tell anyone that you're getting a loan through our bank, but someone else heard that you were buying a house and getting a loan through our bank. And they came up to me at lunch and said, do you know about Allison? And he said, I'm thinking, do I know what about Allison? And they said, her in college. Have you heard about what she did in college? And he's saying this to me. And at 21 years old, 22 years old, I'm sitting across the desk. And now first I'm thinking, everybody is all up in my business talking about <laughs> me and what I used to do. <laughs> and then I'm thinking, oh, no, like what in the world is this story about to be in? So I sit there, I wait, I listen, and he says, uh, they started telling me a story about you sleeping in your car in college. And he said, I want, I want to hear it from you. Is this true? What's the real story? And just as nonchalant as if I'm talking to a friend, I just quickly said, his name was Jeff. I just said, Jeff, I guess the story is that I've been on my own since I was 13. My mom left whenever I was a little girl and I came home one day from babysitting and my dad took my brother and sister and just left me behind. So I've been on my own since I was 13. I moved house to house. Everybody in that day, it's not the story today, but everybody in that day was saying that if you wanted to be successful, that you needed to go to college. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in poverty. So I was just searching for a life better than what I had. And so I figured, you know what, I'll try this college thing out. So I had no help. So I was taking on the student loans. I was working 40, 60 hours a week and mm -hmm. waiting tables, delivering pizzas. And <laughs> My now husband was then my boyfriend. Uh, he proposed to me. And when before he put this ring over my finger, he said, uh, Allison, I want to marry you. I can't wait to marry you. And we're not going to have a wedding until you graduate. Nice. Um, so I said, all right, challenge accepted. <laughs> and my very first call after that engagement, after that proposal was not to a friend. It wasn't to family members. It was to my college advisor. Her name is Linda Johnsonius. I called 1-800-Murray-State-University. She picks up the phone. I say, listen, Linda, I need to graduate early. So I was on, <laughs> I, know, 
<laughs> I was on like a five-year plan and we took that down to three years, which meant I was taking a ton of classes. So I'm just talking with Jeff saying, you know, the reality is I had a place to live in Princeton. I didn't have a place to live an hour away in Murray, Kentucky. I was now taking a ton of classes. I didn't want to get off of a double shift waiting tables, go home, fall asleep, and potentially not wake up to an alarm. I went and asked my teachers, I don't have time to drop a class or fail a class. So what do I have to do to pass? Maybe mm -hmm. I should have asked, what do I have to do to make an A? But I asked, <laughs> what do I have to do to pass? And every single one of them, their paramount need was not that I got every question right, was not that the grammar was correct on my papers. It was be in class. And every mm -hmm. single professor said, if you want to pass this class, be in class every single day. So then I had a clear vision of exactly what to do in order to achieve a successful outcome. So I'd get off work at 10 or 11 o'clock at night and I'd drive an hour to Murray, Kentucky, and I would pull my silver 2000 Chevrolet Impala <laughs> into the J.C. Penney's parking lot. And I would park under a street light in that parking lot. Number one, I could bum the free Wi-Fi from across the street from the school so I could <laughs> do my homework before I went to sleep. And nice. then number two, I didn't have anywhere else to stay. And I just thought if I'm in this parking lot, it's by a busy road. It's under a light. I was just thinking, you know, maybe that'll keep me safe. Maybe nobody will mess with me since I'm out in broad daylight. And so I do my work, go to sleep one or two o'clock in the morning. The sun would get me up. I didn't have to worry about an alarm. <laughs> I was sleeping on it. Started warming shelf. up the car. Absolutely. No, I just never turned it off, which is also, <laughs> man, the things we do when we're young. <laughs> but I'd drive down to CVS, fix my hair, go to class and do it all over again because I had a goal in mind. So I finished telling all of that to Jeff. He probably thought, well, that's more detail than I asked for. <laughs> and then I just said, why do you want to know? And he said, here's the deal, Allison. Remember, this is a bank CEO. He said, I don't like to work with people like you. You're young. You're entitled. You don't work hard. If we do bring you onto our team, we work to train you. We invest in you. We promote you. But at the drop of a hat, you're willing to go work somewhere else. Mm. And he said, but when I heard that story about you, it just made me think maybe I was wrong. Maybe just maybe if this young professional in front of me is willing to work that hard to achieve her goals, then I went on our team to help us achieve ours. And he offered me a management position that I was not qualified for in that bank. And we went on to do really incredible work together. He built, I achieved, I guess I would say, I achieved infinite influence with him because he knew my story. In mm -hmm. order for him to offer me an opportunity, in order for me to be on a sold out mission for his success, my success and the success of that bank, he needed to know my story, to know that I didn't fit the millennial statistic, that I was different, et cetera. But we never would have achieved that influence. We never would have achieved that mutually beneficial outcome had I not been willing to share my story. So that has to be, looking back, just mm. the, the most transformational moment I can think of in terms of shifting someone's thinking through getting to know their story. I didn't realize there was an opportunity to be had on the other side of that story. Uh, there was probably a part of me looking back where I probably said a lot of things where he thought I was an idiot, not not wanting to be, <laughs> I get an A plus in class, sleeping in a parking lot. But sometimes I guess ignorance can be a blessing because I just gave all the details. I was vulnerable and authentic enough to just say, this is who I am. And that was exactly what it took to serve his paramount need and lead us in a better direction. So have you heard that story before, Trevor? I, I have not. Uh, so you were going in for a home loan and he ends up offering you a job. He offered me a job, a management position, <laughs> supervising people. At the wow. age of 21? At the age of 21. Well, no wonder you're so mature because it's kind of like, it's like, how, how is this woman, uh, it's such a mindset because I, I, I have nothing to share on this podcast of value of when I was 21. <laughs> that's funny. well i shouldn't say nothing but that's, that's an absolute i i would say that uh i, I was not as, as as focused uh i was on my way but mm. uh definitely not not at, not looking for a home loan i i, I got a see do <laughs> hey that's all right there's probably things that you did during that time that now you have stories you can share with other people and help them so i think we all have a story that works out just as it should so if we tie this back to the shop floor yes. is that you know we we think that this is what our team needs right this, this is that we, we we make assumptions and we I always like to talk about staying curious but we lose our curiosity because we get caught into the day-to-day -day. and the needs. And I, I love this whole just concept of like, can you just take a deep breath and think about 
what does this person need? And at that point, you weren't processing it in the conversation with Jeff, but he knew what his needs were and he just needed the story to understand it. So again, as we talked about in the beginning of the podcast, it's, it is about transparency. I was talking to someone about that they're an AA and they don't drink. Mm. And they're talking about whether to share that. And it's kind of like, well, you know, if, if I hear that, I think of admiration and I think of like, what did this person get through and what does it take to have an addiction and then, and then not pursue that. Uh, so it's really like, you know, what I talked to them about was what, what's the person you want to work with, right? Like, so if you share that and they don't want to work with you, d does that align with who you want to spend time with? Uh, so th that whole thing of, you know, you were vulnerable, you were open. And then the other thing that I'm taking away and, and, and learning here is that it's just so important to think like, you know, we think it's about the grade. You're at work right now. You think it's about the number at the end of the hour. You think it's about the number of the quality parts. You know, you think it's about the uptime and that's what people are looking at you for. But you may be in that line, putting tape on a whip, keeping the line going, and you've got three people that need your help on something that you can do that nobody else can do. And you're just not, maybe you're just missing out on that opportunity to say people have different needs of you. So if you're a leader in manufacturing, man, we can shut the podcast off right now and you can do that. Kind of think of something. You make me think of, there are so many different ways to take this. We've we've talked about how there's so many ways to think about influence. You said, you know, taking this back to the manufacturing floor. I think about, I think it's important to say that you and your team all have so many needs. I would encourage you to be thinking about what's at the very top for somebody. And one thing I see a lot of smart people doing is they will do they will read the latest research. What do what does today's employee need in 2024, et cetera? And so they get statistical information. And one of the things that's hot right now is people want meaningful work. They want to feel they're respected, et cetera. But here's what I would caution. And I almost, I feel my heart rate increase even as I say this, because this is so important. Do not read that research and go take action. Instead, Read the, read the research, stay curious, uncover and serve the paramount need, because here's what could happen. You could have someone who said, or you're reading all this research that today's employee, if you want them to stay, go all in, level up their performance, be committed, take initiative, they need to feel appreciated. And so the well-intentioned leader, there are a lot of good people doing good work and not achieving the great result that they want. And I think all you need is a foundational perspective shift to set you on a whole different, way better track. Here's what I would say. One size fits all doesn't work. And treating people the way you want to be treated, while we can all agree on the end goal, we all want to be appreciated. The road to get there is so different because our workforce is more diverse than ever. So here's a quick illustration of what I would say. How do you make this realistic on the shop floor? Think about the people you directly supervise. So if you're the CEO, think about your executive management team. If you're a frontline uh, team leader, think about the people who report to you. Here's what I would say. One way to fit, make people feel um, seen, known, appreciated, think about their birthdays. There are some organizations that say when birthdays come up, this is what we do for everybody. We have a potluck for everybody or we get everybody a card, et cetera, with good intentions. The intention yeah. is to make that person, make Trevor feel seen, known, appreciated, also to be fair. And yet, I believe it was in Kentucky, maybe in 2020, 2021, there was someone who was thrown a birthday party by their supervisor. In turn, they quit, turned around, sued them for $400,000 and won because they and said that the birthday. They won. They said that the birthday party caused them like mental anguish, all of this attention, et cetera. And whether I think that's ridiculous or not is not a conversation for today's no. podcast. What I do know is that it's real. It's true. It's happened. A company suffered because someone had good intentions, but didn't take intentional action. Here's what I would say. If you want to build infinite influence with someone, if you want to be more effective and get every person you interact with to go all in with you, get to know their story. And it's easy, simple to do. It only takes a few seconds. Here's how it would play out for a birthday. I would go to John and I'd say, let's say I have John and Kathy on my team. Maybe for the past 20 years, we've done a potluck for everybody's birthday. But going forward, I'm going to be a more intentional leader than ever in 2024. So I go to John and I say, John, you're asking for the story. You say, John, tell me about the best birthday party you've ever had or best birthday you've ever had. And John says, Oh my gosh, the best birthday party I ever had was when seven of my buddies came over and we rode four wheelers all day on a Saturday <laughs> and my mom got pizza. It was awesome. I got all these presents. You have a clue every time you hear a story. 
Mm -hmm. of the next right action for you to take. I like to say that this getting to know people's story and serving the paramount need it, it, you gift yourself an unfailing compass for exactly what to say and do to build that influence. So for John, you're going to throw him that potluck, that birthday party. You're going to make sure everyone is in here celebrating, talking to him. But let's say we've got Kathy. We go to Kathy. Kathy, tell me about the best birthday party you ever had. Kathy might say, the best birthday party I ever had was a girl's day with my mom, just me and her, Mm. nobody else around. Mm. We went on a walk. Maybe she took me fishing. I don't know what they did, but you get a clue right there in that she probably doesn't want all kinds of attention, but maybe to better serve her, to better lead her, to better influence her. I need to have everybody on the team write a card and I'm going to deliver this to her in private. Make one sentence. Everybody write one sentence about Kathy, what she means to you or something. You give that to her. Two totally different approaches. One one cohesive outcome that every action I take as a leader hits. It makes life better for me, for you, and for the organization. You feel seen, known, and respected. One size fits all doesn't work because that opens the door for doubt and people to feel like you're just going through the motions. So Trevor, those are the things, it's a practical thing that I see come to mind when I'm thinking of how does building infinite influence change what we do every day and lead us all to a better outcome. Thoughts? We had a plant, about 1,500 people and really cared about people and wanted to do our, our, our best and great thing, you know, great actions were happening. I remember we got leather jackets at Christmas, you know, just, it was just lots of, lots of great activities happening. And one of the things was they even did birthday cards. And we put a you know, little ten dollar gift certificate, and me being one of the of the senior managers would walk these gift cards and 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 birthday cards around to people. And I can remember a maintenance tech, super skilled, uh, but just a little quiet. And when he knew that that it was his birthday and he was working, like if anybody from management came around, he would go to the washroom. And I'm sitting here reflecting on that moment came back and it kind of hit me. And it's kind of like we, as a leadership team, we're focused on how do we get this person the card? We weren't thinking about connecting and being curious and what are, are their paramount needs. If we would have put his address on there and mailed it, that would have met his needs. But year after year, what do we do, Allison? It became a negative experience for him. Yeah. Yeah. So, and here we are. And then we start thinking, well, geez, that person doesn't have a very good attitude. I'm very grateful, right? The judge, our judge starts to come in and it's so wrong. And it's like, we we overcomplicate it by Mm -hmm. saying, well, we got to do it for everybody. It's like, no, you don't. You don't need to do it for everybody because you're actually proving that you don't see them, that you don't value, Mm -hmm. that you don't understand them. You're actually, because you and I both use the word disconnect. And I I, I thought that's the main problem in manufacturing, but it's in your book as well with other areas. But the disconnect is created by this, by that. And and it's those deeper conversations of just kind of understanding. But here we have such great data. The person's running into the restroom because they don't want the interaction of receiving the card. But we're going to ignore that information Mm -hmm. and we're going to use our own biases and we're going to further the disconnect. It's like, oh, why didn't, why was I having this conversation 15 years ago, Allison? Now, one of the things I hear, and at first it cut me to to my core. I've been talking about the Paramount Need for a couple of years now, and I would get some feedback to say, this is a reminder or this gives Uh, language to what I already knew, but wasn't practicing. And there was a part of me that was cut to the core thinking, no, I wanted to have this new idea. But now I realize, and I've heard you say it before, there's nothing new under the sun. Mm -hmm. But man, can we be more intentional? Can we have just a brighter perspective on what to do, a better perspective, a more impactful perspective on what to do going forward? I believe that there are more well-intentioned leaders in the world today than the media leaves us to believe, leads Mm -hmm. us to believe. I think in order for those good leaders to gain greater success, you don't need radical shifts in what you're doing. You just need these small moments where you're a little bit more intentional. We could have a whole podcast on progressive discipline. Mm, Tell me more. It's one of of my heartstrings because you know, I'll hear in organizations, even today that I'm coaching, it's kind of like, yeah, I got to deliver this coaching or, or this written documentation for this problem and and we lose sight of like why are we writing somebody up it's it's to it's to help with the performance and we just kind of take this blanket because we get so big and we got to be it's consistency right consistency is so important but is, is it more important 
than improving performance? Is it more important than employee retention? Is it more important than that person's life? Like just have the, the having that conversation, I understand that, you know, there's probably some people listening, Trevor, you're out of reality, but maybe it's an and, right? Maybe it's, it's, I'm going to deliver this, this letter, but I'm going to deliver it different. And I had a moment where there was an issue with some, doesn't matter what the issue was, but it involved uh, my executive assistant and she really was more of a coach to me. And I, so I, I delivered, I did, was, that was a good leader and I delivered it. And I knew in my heart, that was one of the worst decisions I ever made. I just felt, I just knew it was wrong and it had the wrong impact. And there's, so I was like, if you're listening and, you, and you've got that gut in your, you've got that feeling and you're, you know, you got to do that. It's probably is wrong. And just kind of like rethink it and saying, okay, so what, what do I need to do different? Cause sometimes I was trying to impress my boss to show that, look at me, I, I can deliver this uh, totally out of character. Not what that person needed. Wasn't being curious, was not having influence, influence. If anything, I, I, I separated my influence because I had it. So you can have infinite influence and you can lose it. And you can lose it. Absolutely. You said, you know, someone listening to this may think I'm out of touch with, with reality. Well, for the hundreds of clients I've worked with over the past several years, no, you're not. But you make me think of specifically what you're talking about and delivering information or news or an evaluation, having a hard conversation. I want When you're thinking about infinite influence, to give you something else to consider is um, the best way to deliver that information is not your default. So I think of... Um, Going back to the story, if you want to know how to deliver hard information to somebody, you get to know their story. One of the best stories you can get to know is how did you grow up? So you're just having casual conversation with your people. Mm -hmm. And I'd say, I would be asking you a question, Trevor, because we have built a relationship. I would say, when you're growing up, was your family more of one to sweep things under the rug? We don't talk about it if things are bad. Or were you one that mm -hmm. if there was a hard conversation, we go to the living room, everybody sits down, talks about it and kumbaya. <laughs> or if there was a hard conversation, is there yelling, screaming and all of that? And even there, when they start telling you these stories, you get these clues for mm -hmm. exactly what to do. So for me, I'm a very direct communicator. And I, if you, I feel like you're pouring sugar on information or what you're saying, if you're being really soft with it, I'm going to think, why are you wasting our time? Get to the daggum point. Yeah. Whereas someone else, for example, my husband, he's a good Southern man. He <laughs> loves some sweet tea, some <laughs> apple pie and some sugar all over the words that I say. And if I'm direct, if I, if I lead him based, if I communicate with him based on what I want, how I want to be communicated with, I'm not going to be more connected with Joe. Instead, I'm going to be more disconnected. He's going to feel like, why are you being rude? Why are you being so quick, et cetera? Whereas if I would step back and say, I'm not going to communicate with Joe the way I want to be communicated with. I'm going to respect him enough to communicate with him the way he wants to be communicated with, because I want to be connected with that person. You want to be connected with your employee, with your boss. You have to pause and think, not how do I want to be communicated with, but how do they want to be communicated with, and then be willing to change the way you've always done things. Well, that's what we want you to do listening to this podcast is that you're getting to your destination and you're starting to think a little bit different. Maybe it's someone in your personal life. Maybe it's someone at work. Uh, you don't know, but it's also confirming, Allison, hearing your stories, you know, with your husband working in manufacturing. I, I met you through your father-in-law, who, who Phil, who who came through manufacturing. And it's not just manufacturing is what you're telling us. Absolutely. It, it, it is. It is all aspects. And, and we just try to bring in uh, cool guests like Allison that we just have a fun conversation with and and, and hoping that, that you're going to be able to leave with that and think different. Allison, what, what's the what's the ending story or the message? that you want listeners to think about Allison Van Hoosier and infinite influence? And I think my parting comments would be this. I don't believe that there's any such thing as a self-made success. I believe successful people, successful organizations are built through the investment and support of others. So when you think about being influenced with people, who do you want to influence, whether it be your boss, your team, or customers, if you want them to go all in with you, to support you for your good, for theirs, and for the good of the organization, be willing, make time, even if it's just a few seconds, to get to know their story and gift yourself that unfailing compass for exactly what to say to captivate their attention, connect with them deeply, and compel them to go all in with you. I want that 
I want that to be <laughs> your story, Trevor. I want that to be the story of every person listening to this today. And I thank you for the opportunity to be able to share. I love it. And I love the fact of, I want to look for clues, Allison. There's mm. clues. And sometimes I, I miss the clues. Uh, and I started mindfulness manufacturing because I'm the one that needed it, right? Just, to, mm. It's just a constant reminder. And just, I always need to be reminded. And for the clues, stop and listen, have some fun. And uh, yeah, just stay stay curious. So yeah, and as we uh, we work together on the on the board of the NSA uh, National Speakers Association Kentucky Group, and uh, love love working with you and love learning learning from you. We will leave the uh, links in the show notes regarding your book and uh, best way to follow you. Best listeners. way to follow me would be on LinkedIn. On LinkedIn, all right, and we'll leave the link to the, your website. And thanks so much for having some fun with us today. Cool. Thanks, Trevor. Have a good day. Hey folks, appreciate you taking the time to join us today. If you enjoyed this episode, share it with someone. Haven't subscribed yet? Do it now. Remember, if you want results, the key is increasing your awareness of how you show up.